and welcome to Delaware Water Gap National Wildlife Refuge or area or something like that. Anyway, we are taking the Rattlesnake Swamp Trail today and hoping, and you can see the lake behind me, and hoping that we can see some top predators like some snakes. There's rattlesnakes and other kinds of snakes. It's cold this morning. We're going to see what we can do. And some bears, which are also hard to see just because they're very large. And if you think about energetic costs of being a bear, they're omnivorous, but they'll, they mean to eat anything, but they do need to keep their energy up. So there are less of them than there would be, let's say, blades of grass, which are lower on the in trophic levels, on the um, pyramid, if you will. I will talk to you later. Mountain Laurel, we're actually in the mountains, and here's my little trail. It gets a little wet, so they put up some boards. It was really nice. And if you take a look, there's a bird flying around over there. It's called a Phoebe. It, it's kind of following me, and it's a flycatcher. And this is what they do. They're kind of curious, and they'll fly back and forth, and they'll look at you. Um, kind of reminds me, there's a, a bird that's supposed to keep travel, keep a traveler's company called the Elapio in, in Hawaii, but that's not what we have here. This is not Hawaii. Take a look. Very little greenery. Still very cold for an April. And that does influence phenology. It does influence time, the time of blood break, although not as much as sunlight and the number of hours of sunlight in a day. Here are some <clears throat> rocky outcroppings, if you take a look in the background there. Um, and this is the kind of area that timber rattlesnakes really, really like. Bears don't mind it either, so... It is a good spot to find both. Um, gives them a good place to hide. Um, there are times of year that they use them for hibernation as well. So for denning in that way. And now um, as rocks get warmer, they can sit on them, bask on them, warm up for the day. Here is the rest of my trail. I will get back to you. These are um, trail markers. And if you're not familiar with them, what this one does and what they tend to do is if they bend to the left like that, that means you're going left instead of that right direction, which really doesn't exist. It was actually much more important down there. There was kind of a fork there. but um, So it is important to follow the trail markers and not get lost. That would be good because no one's here. I'll show you, and I hope this is not upside down, but hey, um, let's just do that. I just really wanted to show you the view from here, which is pretty. Um, we're in a mountain range here. Um, Appalachian Mountains and one thing that does happen this time of year is we do get some hawks migrating back up and they use the hot air that rises off these ridges these thermals um, to help propel them a bit so they can be a little lazy and sore and not expend as much energy but I just wanted to really show you the mountains they're not big mountains at all <laughs> so we are on the actually this is a intersection or a convergence of the rattlesnake swamp trail and the Appalachian Trail and here is some tower thing and um, there's a name to it and I'm sure there's a sign I'll come up to it but I'm not it, this views must be stunning I'm sure but uh, yeah I'm not doing that and the real reason I'm not doing that is because of social distancing right now I can't see a way to keep six or really 14, should be 14 feet, away from anybody if they go up there. And I think there even, might even be someone up there from what I was looking at before. So um, that would be stupid of me, not doing it. But there you go. Pretty town, really. Look, graffiti. But kind of a pretty, view. I'm sure it's a beautiful view from up top. Just not worth it. Also not worth sitting on that um, picnic table. It's nice to look at the daffodils. They're pretty, but um, yeah. At the right time of year, they have nice, beautiful purple flowers as the mountain laurel actually that you saw before um, has nice white, beautiful flowers as well. We're now on the rattlesnake swamp trail yet again and we're down in elevation a bit we reached the top about 1500 feet in elevation which is not very high um when i call any of these things mountains they're more hills than mountains at this point and um 
if you look at the geologic history of the area, it's it's actually kind of interesting. But we are going down this trail, and I'll show you a couple of things as we go. And still haven't seen any bears and snakes, but if I do, you'll see them too. I'll show you, or another plant that I'll show you. I don't know if I, no, no trees today. I don't think I showed you any trees, but here we go. Um, that's hemlock, eastern hemlock. And again, something that you would often find in more elevated areas. And over on the other side is the actual, what we call, rattlesnake swamp. Sounds really cool. It looks like not much. It looks like a swamp. You got some, it, you can tell it's a wet area. It's a low-lying area in the middle of this raised area. And there are trees in it. Makes it a swamp. Do you see here at the swamp is what makes other places more of a bog uh, is this peat moss. And sometimes you get a floating layer of that peat moss. And, and again, you can have a peat bog. Um, one reason that being peat moss, you need to be in a wet, moist area with lots of water is to reproduce. They're in domain bryophyta, which means they're bryophytes, just like the regular old moss that you see, uh, that you've seen in other videos and I've seen today too, uh, pincushion, pincushion moss and stuff like that. And um, because of being um, a bryophyte, they don't have pollen. They do have modal swimming sperm that actually needs to go through water to be able to reproduce. This is a birch on a beech tree like I've been showing you. And the thing about birch trees is you can, if you're in a survival situation or just going camping, there's some, some nice oils and um, in this bark. And you can make a um, little tinder box out of it. You can make some some kindling and light this on fire if you needed a fire, which you would if you were in a survival situation or just camping. But anyway, so this is a gap species as well. And what a gap species means is it waits for a spot, a, a gap. It's wind dispersed. And when a bigger tree falls down, it leaves a gap in the forest. And what happens is these wind dispersed seeds can go pretty far and then they um, they get into that spot and they stay in that spot and they grow and there's sunlight there because birch trees really need that sunlight and they grow, if you take a look, tall and skinny. They don't put much energy into growing wide like some of the other trees. So what they do is they'll grow up, get to that light and eventually be outcompeted by more shade tolerant species that grow wider and will get even taller than the birch trees. But by that time, they've sent out their own seeds to go to another gap. So they rely on these gaps in the forest. We'll talk more about seed dispersal later. I have to talk about differences in morphology of leaves versus needles. So here you go, pine needles, little hemlock, and nice big, wide, broad leaves on these rhododendrons. Now, this, if you think about it, can get more sunlight, spread out more surface area, right? This has less surface area, but what this can do is withstand harsher, drier, and colder conditions. Um, by having less surface area, it's going to lose less water in drier conditions. And you can hear all the chickadees going nuts over my head, but um, maybe you can't. But anyway, so these are pine needles um, in evergreen. And this is a nice example of a, a wide, broad leaf that's meant to get more energy from the sun and get with more surface area. If you take a look here, these are ferns, and we have quite a few of them here. Um, and ferns are not angiosperms. They're not gymnosperms like the conifers that we've been looking at. They are not angiosperms like the rhododendron that's right next to me here. Um, they're in division Terraphyta. Now, I think I said the word domain before, and that's not accurate. Um, division is the, if we're doing botany, it's just like a phylum, basically. And these are seedless, vascular plants. And they reproduce by these little dots that you may be able to see, hopefully, if I can get this in. There you go. The sari that are on the undersides of these leaves. They are vascular. They have the xylem and phloem that go through these stems and and deliver what needs to be delivered in bulk transport, the the sugar and the water and all that. But they are seedless and they are not flowering plants. So they do live in swampy areas. So when you do see a lot of ferns, 
that would be the reason why it's nice and moist for that. These leaves are chestnut oak, the ones that have the serrated edges. Um, that means there must be oak trees around here, which means that acorns exist somewhere too. I can see a whole bunch of chestnut oak leaves if I look on the ground. Um, well, that brings me to a conversation about seed dispersal as we look at the ground. So the idea is that if you are if you have heavy seeds that provide a lot of nutrients to your offspring. You do need a way for them to get away from the parent tree and not compete for resources and also maybe get potential diseases. We talked about that last time. So animal dispersal is your best bet. And that's why fruit and berries exist so that, you know, if they're red, it really is supposed to be targeted for birds. If they're white, I think that's for insects. Yellow for mammals. Yes, that's right. And these are ways to get those animals to take that seed, even if they have to eat the fruit, of course, Take that seed and put it somewhere that's advantageous for that plant species. So you have wind dispersal, you have animal dispersal, water dispersal, coconuts, for a good example of water dispersed seeds. Um, we talked about fires as necessary for pine trees and their regeneration with their seeds, but that's not really dispersal. Uh, but there, there are alternate mechanisms for animal dispersal, like the ones that get, have sticky ends and stick to fur. So seed dispersal is really important look at this stream that's cutting through um if you take a look at any stream really they don't just go straight humans make them straight it's called channelization when we take away those bends and those bends are really important because around those bends is where they go slower there's actually pools where it stops like this and riffles so the pools and riffles are different environments for different organisms so the riffles are when they're going faster in the pools or where they're really just like a swimming pool, they, they slow down and stop. There's actually temperature differences as well as be, because of channelization where we tend to cut down the vegetation around it and some um, quote unquote prevent flooding actually causes more flooding in another spot often. But um, so when we cut down the riparian buffers, the areas around streams, for example, where there's vegetation, which adds some nutrients to the stream from the leaves and, and provides some shade. You can see there's some shade there and there's some sunlight there. Those are different environments for different organisms and, and that's really important. So a human impact upon streams often is that we try to make them straight and that may be good for boats and navigation, but it's definitely not good for the ecology and the environment. Often used to make reeds around holiday time, non-denominational winter holiday time. And th that is called club moss. It's not actually a moss in the same way as the graphites that I showed you before. And it has a whole other way of reproducing. Um, still not Andrew's bird. You look at this ledge with all these crevices and these rocks. Um, yes, those, there were people who came up behind me. No, I did not turn around, and I did move away, so I'm still safe. I'm good. But anyway, that's why I cut, had to cut the video in half. Um, but here, if you take a look, you ever feel like you're being watched? Well, I'm sure I am right now. Um, don't know by what, but there are resources don't go to waste in nature. There are crevices in these rocks, big crevices, maybe for bears. I mean, this is bear country. That is very likely that some of these could potentially be used by bears. Um, it's a nice, warm, safe place that they can protect and they can be protected from the rain. They, they're just like us. So something, whatever it might be, is in those, in some of those, not all of them, I'm sure, not, not all occupied at once, but some of them. And I'm sure something is watching me right now. Can't see it, don't know what, and it's not really that scary. There's always something watching, even if it's just the birds and the trees, they're watching you. They need to make sure they're safe. Now structure in the back, right there. Hmm. That's actually a beaver lodge. There are beavers on this lake. Uh, I knew that before I came here. I don't see any today. There's actually another lodge somewhere over there as well, but that's where they live. So that's a, a beaver's house. Just wanted to show you that. 